Hello, this is Mark Ford, the founder of Precise Education. I wanted to thank you for checking out our website and purchasing what we believe is high quality uh, CME for uh, low cost. Uh, our goal here is to present uh, topics that are really of interest by speakers that are uh, high caliber within their field uh, in a way that you would enjoy to watch. This talk, Total Joints in Sports Medicine, was originally presented in the Fredericksburg Regional Sports Medicine Symposium, uh, 16th annual one, uh, as an EBP talk. For this uh, setting, though, it is a Category A talk for the athletic trainers and Type 1 credit for the physical therapist. This will fall in the athletic training domains of injury and illness prevention, as well as wellness promotion, as well as therapeutic intervention. It is approved for category A, 0.5 hours by the BOC, and type one credit, 0.5 hours by the Virginia PTA via partnership with University of Virginia and our reciprocity agreement with the BOC. As always, please check with each and every state um, uh, policy so you're uh, approved and we're happy to help you with that if you send us an email at info at .com. Once again, thank you, and remember to keep track of the attendance color for each talk. You'll need that for the evaluation at the end to get your certification. For this talk being presented, it is the color blue. Once again, thank you, and enjoy the time. Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Nicole. I'm the athletic trainer at Riverbend High School, and I've been helping Mark out this year as the director of marketing for Precise Education because we're going to this virtual format. Speaking right now is going to be Mark Ford. He is the president and CEO of Precise Education. He completed his undergrad at James Madison University for athletic training. He then went to Wake Forest School of Medicine to receive his physician assistant degree. And he also got a master's from the University of Nebraska because he loves learning just so much. <laughs> he is a physician assistant at Orthopedic Specialty Clinic and works really closely with the local high school athletic trainers, as well as our local college, university, the University of Mary Washington. Uh, on a typical non-2020 Friday, you can find him on the sideline of any high school football game. And he loves hiking. He de-stresses by backpacking the Appalachian Trail. And the past couple years, he's been lucky enough to get off of speaking. So this year, he's back on for a talk. And I'm really excited that he's back speaking this year. So I am pleased to introduce Mark Ford. Well, great. Well, thanks. Gosh. Um... Uh, I have so many stories I can tell and fill up all of the time that I don't have. I unfortunately have a short time period to do my, my talk. Um, so uh, we'll have to get kind of rolling. So I'm going to get my screen up for you all. My talk is purple, by the way. You can list that down if you want to. Um, purple. Uh, I've got all these lights in my eyes. You would have thought I was a teenager here in my YouTube studio. So... Uh, to see if I can see where I can see. There we go. I think we're good. Okay. Um, so you all should be able to see my slides and hopefully can hear me. Any problems, just jump in the chat. Nicole's going to monitor that. And I've uh, built in a little bit of time for questions as well um, uh, at the end. We do have a little bit of extra time because we're going into lunch. My talk is on total joints in sports. Is this a good idea? And Nicole did such an awesome job introducing me that I will not go through my credentials that I have. I have been in Fredericksburg for 20, uh, 20 years or so. I've been a PA in sports medicine for 21 years. Uh, when I first came out, I was primarily sports medicine trained, lots of teams, uh, worked at the Olympic Training Center. And then as my population has aged out, I have a lot more joint replacements. So I think I, I can get both sides of this topic covered pretty well. Um, uh, no disclosures to anything presented directly in the talk. As you heard, uh, we organized uh, Precise Education. There's a small percentage of the revenue that goes to paying for all this stuff. And my talk is purple. Here are my objectives that we'll cover uh, throughout. Okay, so why are we talking about this? What, what are we talking about? 
degenerative joint disease, uh, which is the catch-all term for osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, degeneration of the joint uh, is, uh, we have some statistics that have been uh, pre provided by, by the CDC. The majority of degenerative joint disease is osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis makes up greater than 80% of the degenerative joint disease. Rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis come in second and third, but they're very distant. Most patients have osteoarthritis, which is classic with osteophyte bone spur formation, unilateral narrowing of the joint sclerosis. And there's a lot of other different functions of that. It affects almost 55 million people in America. That's almost a quarter of our population have DJD of some fashion. It does tend to favor women a little bit more than men, but you can see the numbers are roughly about the same. The CDC extrapolated their data out to 2040 and, and the numbers really start to swell as we hit baby boomers and moving on with our population, close to 80 million or one third of the population will suffer from DJD by 2040. And there's a lot of variables that will come along with that. I'll be talking about several of those in the talk, but obesity tends to be the one that continues to run up the top. As our population continues to get bigger, we get more and more wear and tear. The most, I think, uh, pressing statistic in this slide is the 23.7, 24 million people. That's almost half of the patients with degenerative joint disease suffer with difficulties with ADLs. That means they have a difficult time walking, bathing, hygiene, feeding themselves. This isn't sports and activities. This is just daily living activities. Half those patients have a difficult time with that. So total joint arthroplasty, total joint replacement, total hip replacement, THR, T, uh, TKR, total joint replacement in 2014, Sloan presented in 2018 data of almost 4, 400,000 total hip replacements in the population and almost 700,000 total knees in the population. He also extrapolated that data out to 2030, which um, you know we're halfway there almost between those numbers. And we're looking at total hip replacement numbers increasing to 635,000, 171% increase. Total knee replacements, even more, 1.3 million total knee replacements by 2030, almost a two-fold increase in total knee replacements. For you all that have not seen a total knee replacement, here is a picture of one. It is somewhat of a misnomer. People think with total knee replacements that we kind of cut the whole knee out and uh, replace the whole thing, but it's really not the case. Total knee replacement is really a resurfacing on the end of the bone. We put a flange over top of the femur, a tray on the tibia that are made out of metal, and then there's a polyethylene bumper cushion or bearing surface that sits in the middle. The majority of the ligaments in a knee replacement are preserved, the collateral ligaments and the posterior cruciate on most cases, and the anterior cruciate ligament is uh, sacrificed in almost all joint replacements. So who cares? What do, we got a lot of variables that kind of come into this. So uh, also presented by Sloan in 2018, we looked at the average age of total joint replacement was greater than 65 years of age in 2013. In 2014, that number flipped to under the age of 65 and it is decreasing in age 0.1 year per year of decline. So if you look at those numbers, we're probably closer to 64 years of average age now and those numbers continue to decrease. We also see an advancing age population. So we're getting older and we're living longer. Our population numbers are increasing, our life expectancy is increasing, and our joint replacement patients are getting younger. So we're seeing more and more of this. There's also a couple tools in our toolbox that have been taken away from us. So if you are aware of the opioid epidemic currently that's uh, raging we used to use narcotics to help manage arthritic pains. That's now a no-no. So using uh, pain relievers, uh, even things like tramadol, which was one of the ones uh, originally uh, looked at for uh, uh, synergistically working with anti-inflammatories for controlling arthritic pains. Now those are not so good. Anti-inflammatories are kind of the devil's work right now. 
liver and kidney disease, peptic ulcer disease, black box warning across all anti-inflammatories that they can cause stroke and heart attacks. So they're asking us not to keep patients on anti-inflammatories for a longer period of time. And then we have all these other um, second and third line treatments like the visco supplementation that was, uh, may have been told, or may remember those as the, the, the chicken shots that came from the coombs of the roosters in the original. They're all synthetic now. Success rates aren't real good with that. We have data, maybe one third of the population get better with it. Biologics, PRP injections, stem cell injections, uh, very expensive, but again, variable results. And then supplementation. I did a talk about six, seven years ago on supplements, glucosamine, chondroitin, MSN, None of these have really statistically proven to, uh, to separate away from placebo. So we've got tools in our toolbox that aren't really very good. And actually some of the ones that are good have been taken away from us. So we're not left with many options. So why are we talking about total joint replacements in uh, a sports medicine symposium? And this kind of goes back to Bo Jackson. And uh, this is where it really got started for some of you all that are real young in this group, probably don't even know him. But Bo Jackson was a two sport athlete. And in 1991, he uh, suffered an acetabular fracture or a socket fracture and developed avascular necrosis of his hip. In uh, 1992, he underwent his first total hip replacement, which ended his football career. He went on to play baseball uh, with the uh, White Sox and the Angels uh, afterwards. So now we've got a two-sport athlete with a total joint replacement and back to major league sports. And uh, this was uh, wildly popular at this time because he was just such a hoss, such an athlete, and he uh, was uh, uh, relatively successful in that time period. But we got a lot of other uh, patients that we need to kind of talk about. And Nicole, you can put up my second slide as well, or my second poll that can come up. And then I'll get to this slide here in just a second, but I have a second poll there that's in the queue. I'm gonna go on while Nicole gets that. But uh, we really, really have problems with expectations. Our population is getting younger and younger. Why is it that when you Google uh, uh, joint replacements and running, joint replacements in sports, you'll find a wealth of information on the internet, but it typically is forums and uh, community pages and um, uh, orthopedic practices that have, um, put up um, advertisements regarding running and joint replacements. Not gonna find much uh, literature that supports those things. And we'll get back to that. It's obviously the crux of my, my talk. But um, uh, we have patients that are having higher and higher demands. They're asking for more and more. So the uh, journal uh, bone joint uh, uh, case in October 2018, uh, did a case study on a competitive runner on a 20 year old that suffered avascular necrosis of his hip and went on to run a four minute, five second mile with total hip replacement. And in that case study, they were looking at six year data out and he was doing excellent. I think you will find that most orthopedics uh, will not argue that point that you can do really well with joint replacements early in their life, but that's not, I believe, the crux of the issue. The NFL did some studies as well. They looked at 2,400 athletes uh, who had retired one year to 10 years uh, out and uh, found 244 joint replacements in that crowd. Now, remember looking only 10 years past retirement at this point, uh, you were much more likely to have total hip replacement. Uh, Davies reported on this but the data only went out 10 years. So you think of the average career of an NFL athlete is 30 years old. They're only looking at athletes that are 40, uh, maybe 40 years out, and they still had already found uh, over 200 joint replacements. I wonder what we look like when we go 20 years out from retirement, 30 years out from retirement, those joint replacement numbers are going to explode. So what does the data really say? What, are, what, what do we have in our literature? which uh, did a uh, article in sports medicine in 2016, and it was looking at total knee replacements and uni compartmental knee replacements, which is replacing part of the joint. 
So uh, total knee replacement and the, uh, the return to, uh, to, to sports, very wide number in the longitudinal meta-analysis, meta 36 to 89% of patients return to sports. There's a big difference between one third and nine out of 10 uh, returning to different sports. The unique compartmental knee replacement numbers were definitely a little bit better. Three quarters to almost all of them returned to sports. But in both of these studies, uh, the majority of them return to low impact activities, not medium or high impact activities. There's another study done by Kahn in the Geriatric Orthopedic Surgical Rehab Journal 2016. And this study looked at activity levels um, uh, after total joint replacement and activity levels in the non-surgical population. So he looked at over 2,000 people and the, the next uh, study, I think also buttonholes with this one really very well. The activity levels of the patients with total knee replacements and the activity levels with patients that chose non-surgical approach, the activity levels were the same. Now keep in mind in the Khan study, he really wasn't looking at activities of daily living and pain relief. He was looking at activity and sport re uh, results. Uh, there's no doubt that joint replacement improves activities of daily living and pain control versus the non-surgical route. When we talk about activities, the data suggested that maybe it really wasn't much of a difference. British uh, Medical Journal in 2020, so a much more up-to-date uh, article, looked at 4,074 patients. And this was, I think, one of the most interesting studies. They looked at patients who were doing sports up until total knee replacement versus the patients that had discontinued sports a year prior to joint replacement. So in this study, we're looking at people that were active in doing their sports right up to total knee and the patients that had given it up a year before. Active uh, patients that were continuing up to their total knee, most of those patients returned back to medium and low level sports. Patients that had discontinued sports greater than a year prior to their joint replacements did not return to sports statistically. And I would extrapolate this data out, oops, I would extrapolate this data out to my practice as well. The patients that are active prior to joint replacements return to activity levels afterward. The patients that are losing weight prior to joint replacements, they lose weight afterwards. The patients that are uh, active in their lifestyle will continue to do so. Those patients that have given it up a year prior to their joint replacements, they say they're going to lose weight after their joint replacement, whatever be the case, as a whole, those patients typically don't get back on the horse and get going again. So we've got a few studies uh, in the reference. Um, uh, my uh, Bradbury, Huck, and Jason studies really support the same piece of information. So active patients typically do well. Active patients that continue with sports prior to joint replacements typically can return to that. But keep in mind, even in this study, they return back to low and medium levels of sport activities, not typically high-end activities. So what's the question? Is this marketing or is it science? If you can go read all these things on the internet about joint replacements and returning back to activities, where is the data? I uh, look at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, which is the governing board, and they came out with a position statement in, in, in 2017 done by Ferran. And it says that most surgeons and the position statement coming out of the academy advise no high impact activities such as running, jumping, or jogging after and high impact sports after joint replacements for the rest of your life. So our position statement coming out of the academy is, it's not a really good idea. And I've mentioned it previously, there is no peer review literature that supports high-end activities after joint replacement. Nothing out there was the crux of part of this talk, was trying to find literature to support that, that, that case. And the answer is there isn't. So you can find a lot of uh, hypothetical information in a lot of forums and chats, but we have nothing to suggest that joint replacement and high levels of activity really make sense. So where the rubber meets the road, and this is really the crux of why this is not a good idea. Um, I am in a screen where I can't see my poll, if she was able to get that poll up and if it was answered. 
Statistically speaking, 95% of joint replacements will last 15 years or greater in the average population, okay? So it's the average population doing average activities. We actually hope those numbers will get better and better with the uh, cross-linked polyethylenes and some of the fancy things that we do. But statistically, when we look at our longitudinal studies, we're looking at about 15 years or greater. And the first joint replacement is the best joint replacement. Revision surgery typically have more and more restrictions just as much as they have more and more complications. So there's no doubt that joint replacements can be a significant positive in people's lives. You all have grandmas, moms, sisters, brothers, aunts and uncles that have undergone joint replacements. Statistically speaking, total hip replacements look at about a 95 to 97% success rate, especially as we've gotten much better about the dislocation rates. And total knee replacements sit at 90 to 95% success rates. So we know these are good pain relieving surgical procedures. We know that they improve activities of daily living. But the problem is the negatives. The negative is the expectations that patients have. When you're 70 and you like to go out and eat uh, lunch with uh, your friends and you like to take walks in the uh, park with your dog and maybe do a little landscaping, that joint replacement may uh, reach all of your expectations. But if your expectation is to go back and run and get back into higher levels of activity, then it may not give you what you want. And that's primarily because of the wear patterns. So down in the corner here, you have a picture of a total hip replacement uh, polyethylene bearing and a total knee replacement bearing. And that's really the issue. As these joints uh, handle the exponential wear that comes with foot over foot dynamics, then the wear patterns on these polyethylene bearings can get significant. Now we tried with total hips to do metal on metal or ceramic on ceramic and all these types of things. And um, eh, they were a little bit better, but we ended up with some more complications there as well. As a whole, the gold standard is back to using polyethylene bearings. I did just get an answer to the polls. Awesome guys, you did pretty well. 60% of you answered 15 years or greater, which is typically that. And those of you that pushed out 25 years, you're probably right, but we'll have to see longitudinally how long that goes. And you conservatives at 10 years, good, because you're probably taking better care of your patients. So let's get back to Bo Jackson. So Bo, uh, Bo's last at bat, bat was in 1994. So he went on to play uh, baseball for a couple years. He retired at 32 years of age. Uh, in uh, 2006, he did an interview with NPR. And by that time, he had had three total hip replacements. Um, this is not a picture of his total hip, but uh, I can assure you it's a bad day for the orthopedic surgeon uh, that sees this. But he had to uh, three total joint replacements by 2006, and the guy is only 44 years of age at that point. Uh, I haven't found any data past that. He did an interview in 2017 with USA Today, and he said if he knew back then what he knew now, he would never have played football. And uh, I think it's the crux of the issue when we talk about high levels of activity uh, and just one, simply the wear and tear that professional athletics and uh, these things will uh, to do on our body. And we're certainly seeing those numbers. So in conclusion for the EBP talk, our literature uh, from multiple peer reviewed articles show uh, that um, it's probably not a great idea to, to, to get back to high levels of activity after joint replacements. And we have no peer reviewed uh, literature to support that it is okay. As we get increasing longitudinal data, uh, we're gonna find pretty good results with our activities of daily living, but you're gonna probably see uh, expounding numbers in regards to joint replacements and revision rates with high rates. So remember our runner at 20 that ran the four minute mile, six years his data was excellent, but what's his data at 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years, where this guy is going on to require multiple revisional surgeries. And the reason why this talk is important to the athletic trainers, as well as the physical therapists in the group, is you all are on the front row. You all are interacting with them, not to mention the industrial athletes, but the college and professional uh, settings. There is so much uh, social media pressure that joint replacements are so great. I'm going to go back to these levels of activity. And the answer is, yeah, they probably can go back and run on it. But the long-term uh, 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 
ramifications of their health is really not very solid. So as, um, as medical practitioners, we, we certainly have a moral and ethical uh, component to, uh, to support and protect our athletes and, and, and advise them against this. So I have a couple of references which are in the talk. And uh, once again, my talk is purple if um, uh, you did not get that at the beginning. And uh, you can email in the chat. I did leave an extra little bit of room in our talk to do some questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I suspect Nicole will get back in here in just a second. You do have one question. Would jogging with dog agility be advised? So um, uh, tough question. So the answer is no, and the answer is no. So the wear patterns that come with foot over foot activities where the problem is. So jumping, uh, jogging, uh, uh, those types of things aren't good. But remember, to some degree, we are replacing joints uh, to improve patients' lifestyle and hobbies. So I have several patients that um, do dog training and show uh, uh, and they zip down the little thing for their 45 seconds. And if they had to chase after a kid that was running into the street, certainly you can jog on a component like that for those short periods of time. But from a medical data standpoint, my recommendations is avoid any type of jogging and foot over foot activity because of where patterns increase. But I guarantee you, if you ask 10 orthopedic surgeons, you get a couple different answers, uh, but our medical data does not support jogging in any form. If you guys do decide that you have questions, feel free to email us. And again, thank you for attending. Thanks, Nicole.